Hello and welcome to Long Covid Physio Podcast. My name is Darren Brown, I am a physiotherapist and I am living with Long Covid. And today it's Sunday evening in London and we have a guest from New York in the United States. We have Jenna. Jenna, will you do us the honour of introducing yourself? Gladly. Uh, my name is Jenna Tostome Cuso. I am a physical therapist in New York City at Mount Sinai Health at the Abilities Research Center. Um, and my role uh, really is quite unique in that I get to play both dual clinical and research roles, primarily working with our post-acute COVID or long COVID rehabilitation program and COVID Center of Excellence. Wow, so that's quite a unique role, hey? <laughs> it definitely is. Um, our group primarily started out in the neuro rehab space uh, pre-COVID. And really, once things started taking off, both with acute COVID, as well as really starting to identify the need of individuals with long COVID, um, my role shifted. And, and that's really the work I've been doing over the past year. Oh, amazing. Well, I must admit, so Mount Sinai has kind of, in the long COVID field, kind of gained quite a reputation. But I must admit, I don't feel very familiar with Mount Sinai. Like, I'm not based in the States. I'm not based in New York. So I don't know much about it. Um, right. Have you worked there long or...? Um, so I've been with Mount Sinai, interestingly enough, um, about a little over a year and a half. I had been on the team about five, six months before COVID hit. So I was, I was still relatively new figuring out where I was going in the hospital and COVID hit in March of 2020 here in New York mm -hmm. City. And so I, uh, I quickly, quickly got accustomed to Mount Sinai, but the work we're doing as an institution um, has been really quite remarkable throughout the course. So I'm, I'm incredibly proud to be representing them in here today. Yeah, absolutely. So I wondered if you'd tell us a little bit more about um, the, your experiences of working through this role that you've got both academically and clinically um, sure. in long COVID services. Absolutely. So um, it's always helpful to tell this a bit as a story. And so um, in March of 2020, um, obviously the COVID-19 pandemic really, really exploded to say the least. And New York City um, here in the States, we became the epicenter of the epicenter um, as well as Mount Sinai Hospital really, really became quite over inundated and really um, became an, a, a key place for individuals with acute COVID-19. And so our group at the Abilities Research Center, we began by developing um, a remote patient monitoring program for patients with acute COVID. So patients who were coming to the health system um, were not deemed medically indicated for admission, but under normal circumstances would really benefit from increased monitoring. We began monitoring those patients. And so in that cohort, we were seeing over a thousand patients of acute COVID. And now we're going through March, April into May of last year. So probably around this time, we started recognizing that 10 to 20% of our patients within the acute COVID cohort were just not getting better. And the clinical presentation was changing and it was manifesting. So we weren't seeing the same symptoms that we saw in the initial infection, but rather we started seeing symptoms such as post-exertional malaise, fatigue, uh, tachycardia or increased heart rate, shortness of breath, all of these symptoms that again, really, were a bit different than that initial infection, which led us to start to say, what is this? What are, what are we up against, right? Because I think so much of us, so many of us in the medical field and even in the rehabilitation field, we imagined we have a, a respiratory illness on our hands, the cardiopulmonary end of rehab needs to be ready. Um, but this just had a very different flavor to it. And so um, we recognized quite quickly that the likely underpinnings and admittedly as a medical field, and I'm sure we'll talk about this, is still really trying to get their head around what all of this is, recognized very quickly that there was some autonomic flavor to this. It felt like there was an autonomic component. There is still that cardiovascular component. And so we started to look holistically and, and quite quickly, um, our director, his name is Dr. David Petrino. He is the director of rehabilitation innovation for the Mount Sinai Health System. Um, He's a physical therapist and neuroscientist and is just an incredible, incredible leader. And he quickly assembled uh, a multidisciplinary team. So I came on as the physical therapist. We work quite closely with a cardiologist uh, who's also extraordinary, Dr. Amy Kontorovich. 
um, a number of other different players, postdoctoral fellows, research individuals, nutritionists, strength and conditioning coaches. And we began looking at this really as a, as a holistic group. Um, and so over the course of the past year, we've really been delving in from a clinical perspective first to better understand what is long COVID or post-acute COVID syndrome, because the, the nomenclature keeps changing. Um, yeah, yeah. Really, what is it and what can we do to help? Um, and so that's really been my role in all of this is kind of fitting into uh, the clinical end of things, designing rehabilitation programs for post-acute COVID, and also trying to help to understand um, really what we're facing from both a medical perspective and a rehabilitation perspective. So that's really interesting, isn't it? That it's almost like a positive unintended consequence of, I'm presuming because the health systems were overloaded and like you said, people that may have ordinarily been admitted weren't being admitted. You developed this program to more closely monitor people that weren't being admitted to hospital, but it was through that ability to more closely monitor people and follow them through across their trajectories. You started to pick up these patterns early because actually, if I reflect on experiences here in the UK, we didn't have that, where if we weren't admitted to hospital, that was it. You were just yeah. left. Absolutely. <laughs> and so no. no one was monitoring that. So actually it's really interesting that that approach has enabled you to gather data very early on and obviously then lead you to develop services by the sounds of things. Absolutely. And I think what we've also found both from a clinical perspective, but also from a data perspective, now having the chance to look at the data that we've collected so far, we're finding that individuals who are now presenting with long COVID, um, first and most foremost, it's not always the severe cases, right? These are largely individuals who were possibly not admitted to the health system, maybe initially had mild or moderate initial infections. So it's not tr the traditional cohort of individuals we would expect with something like a post-intensive care syndrome or a PICS from being intubated or being in the hospital, um, really the initial infections were mild to moderate. And so as we get to watch those patients over time, we're starting to realize that, you know, maybe patients we originally thought like, oh, it's a mild infection should be in, out and on your way in a week or two, you know, we're really facing this longer situation. But yes, we, we really were at a really unique vantage um, having watched patients for quite some time. And, and I really applaud the group that we have is that we've really mobilized quite quickly to see what we can do. And this is an ever-changing field. Um, I, we're, we're up against a diagnosis that is still very, very new. Um, and I think that as a medical community together, we're learning. Um, but my hope is the sooner that we can address it, the better. Yeah, like I'm really interested actually maybe what data you were able to monitor then over, over time with that. So what sort of things were you picking up from people that were not admitted to hospital? Sure. So I can talk a bit about both the acute COVID data, which we had recently published, um, as well as some of the newer data that we're looking at for individuals within our rehab program. And I can talk a bit about that a bit more. Um, and so from the acute COVID perspective, we were watching clinical, we were ideally looking for clinical deterioration. So really looking at vital signs, um, subjective report of shortness of breath, subjective report of increasing headache, um, any clinical red flags that we might have expected for an individual to demonstrate, um, essentially how our program worked very early on and still to this day works, is uh, patients self-report their symptoms, including some objective physiological metrics, as well as self-report of symptoms. A clinician on the back end, uh, we assembled a team of about 30 to 40 providers who were watching on the back end as that data came in, and should a clinical red flag be identified, that patient then could rapidly be triaged within the health system. And so we were able to really, uh, within that scope, identify triage events to get patients back to the health system if their status was changing. Um, and so from the acute COVID perspective, that really was incredibly helpful. Um, number one, to manage capacity of those being admitted, but also to really create this beautiful safety net for individuals who had been dismissed, not dismissed necessarily, but sent home from the hospital system because they didn't meet criterion for admission, really making sure that they were safe in the home. Um, that was the acute end of things. And then for long COVID, it's continued to develop as we've uh, really started to understand. And so currently we're monitoring everything from um, visual analog scales of fatigue, um, different types of headache, vital signs, physiological metrics, activity limitations, and quite a number of different patient reported outcomes. 
Oh, really? Okay. And so, um, so where are things now then? So what, what, what have you developed for people living with long COVID? <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. I, and that's, um, you know, I think as physical therapists and those of us in the rehabilitation space, um, it's a, it's a terrific opportunity really to step in and, and demonstrate our skill set and really step in to help individuals. And so um, after understanding what we were facing, and again, we developed, we assembled this really terrific interdisciplinary team and, and we really got together to put our heads together. Um, I have worked very closely to develop a rehabilitation. Um, it's not necessarily a protocol, it's more of an approach model. Um, it's called ACT for PACS. Um, it's our new nomer for it, ACT for PACS, um, Autonomic Conditioning Therapy for Post-Acute COVID Syndrome. And so what the concept of the ACT for PACS model is, and this is an interesting topic to me, I think, because it's been a bit controversial, um, particularly really? in the rehab space, um, the idea of grading exercise for individuals with COVID or post-acute COVID or long COVID. And so I think there's been a lot of um, conversation, particularly, and, and it moves so rapidly, but in the past few weeks about the use of aerobic exercise and exercise prescription in general for long COVID. Um, and so what we've decided to do is we've taken this concept and we've really scaled. And so we've developed a program for patients that begins with prehabilitation breath work. So we really prioritize use of breath work and ventilatory control as a prehabilitation program. And slowly but surely patients are integrated into the ACT for PACS program, which is a graded scale of supine based exercise, progress to upright based exercise, active range of motion, really time based intervals, very gentle RP, and slowly grading into things like overground walking intervals, um, increases in activity, energy conservation strategies built into that, and slowly but surely building up toward a higher degree of graded aerobic exercise. And so um, we are in the process of writing up our manuscript that I've been green lighted to share data. Um, we are really happy to report that we have seen a very positive response in, in our cohort who has been doing physical therapy with aerobic exercise or graded aerobic exercise, and I really stress the graded portion, um, we have seen improvements in fatigue. We has the primary symptom, we've seen really great improvements in patient reported outcomes, things like quality of life. Um, and as a physical therapist, that's that's what we're after, right? Is seeing those those different types of metrics move. And so that's largely where our program is right now. Um, and we're continuing to grow and continuing to understand what we're doing. So you mentioned that it's um, been a controversial topic. Um, would you tell us more about that? Sure. And and again, I think it's quite interesting because in my mind, it's been like the past few weeks where it's become a bit more controversial. Okay. Um, and so I do know that there are several groups who have been discussing this idea that graded exercise or particularly aerobic exercise can be provocative for long COVID symptoms. And so um, in its purest form, when we look at some of those recommendations, in my mind, we're looking at the extremes of aerobic exercise. So for example, um, presentations of long COVID often get dubbed POTS or they get dubbed dysautonomia. Um, and our group has been very, very clear and, and quite hesitant to name such a thing because we're still trying to understand the underlying pathophysiology behind it. Um, and so I will 100% agree that aerobic exercise in its purest form when given to the intensities that are often given for things like POTS and dysautonomia, they'll absolutely be provocative to patient symptoms with long COVID. Um, very early on, we started, as we started developing our programming, we found that very, very quickly that symptom stabilization is the key in all of this, is getting patient symptoms under control before progressing. Um, as a physical therapist uh, who primarily works in the neurospace, as well as talking with many of my colleagues who work, I think, across all settings, um, no pain, no gain doesn't apply here. Um, one more repetition doesn't apply here, right? That mentality of pushing beyond limits is absolutely not what we're trying to do, but rather be very conscious of the grading of intensity that we're providing to patients so that they can tolerate slow but short progressions. And, and again, to see that that type of intervention is positively affecting fatigue as opposed to really flaring symptoms up I think that's the really the angle that we've been taking on all of this. So with that then, does that mean that you are 
only titrating the um, amount of activities or exercises that somebody's doing dependent on their symptoms? We are letting symptoms be the guiding point, absolutely. So all of our patients prior to starting rehabilitation, um, first they meet with a physiatrist um, or a cardiologist or both. Um, and so we really start to get their medical symptoms under control. All patients receive cardiac clearance to make sure that there is no underlying cardiac pathology because there have been a smaller cohort of patients, but nevertheless a cohort who are presenting with things like pericarditis and the like. So cardiac clearance across the boards. And then from there, patients are beginning therapy under symptom stabilization criterion. And so moving through the phases of rehabilitation is completely guided by RPE, so rate of perceived exertion, as well as a visual analog of symptoms. And so we talk quite a lot to patients about this idea of energy windows, right? So it falls in the lines of energy windows or symptom stability. I use that analogy every single day where, you know, prior to developing long COVID, your energy window was massive and you can fit so much into this great window. And now we're up against a window that's drastically smaller. And so the conversation becomes, how do we understand your symptoms and safely go about your day so that we're not flaring up your symptoms? We're not finding that, again, no pain, no gain, right? That's not the mentality we want to be working with. And so that's definitely taken into consideration. Interesting. And so what time frame is this program being utilized over? Is this a short time frame, a long time frame? Yes, so that's a fabulous question. It's quite it's something that I spend a, quite a bit of time educating patients on, but also we're spending a good amount of time researching. And so um, unfortunately or unfortunately, this is a long-term process. Um, programming at minimum is 12 weeks, uh, but I do have patients who have been on program quite a bit longer. Um, it is a slow moving uh, trajectory, but a trajectory nevertheless. Um, and really the primary goal is that symptom stability so that as those symptoms stabilize, we can watch the needle start to move for a positive change. Um, but yes, it is a bit of a longer program. Um, the other analogy I use with patients is to be mindful that this is not a traditional injury. This is not three sets of 10 and something is fixed. Um, it's a bit a different. It's, profession, that three sets yeah, of 10. <laughs> yeah, the three sets of 10. We, I, we love that three sets of 10 as physios, but I think it's something that we, um, it takes a mentality shift again, both from the clinician perspective and the patient perspective. Um, and I think it's about building that team mentality that this, we are a team in this and we are going to go through this together in a really big initiative to manage your symptoms and to get you back to the things that you're passionate about. So if I've understood it right then, so it sounds like the program starts with this breathwork program. Um, so I don't quite understand what that means, but I'd love to ask you, sure. but it starts with the breathwork program to start with a start steady, with steady, oh, I'm getting myself repeat back. That was weird. Um, so to get a, a, a stability, as you said, and then from that, starting with like a supine exercise program. So, um, so laying down, doing some movements to build up strength and, and stabilize symptoms again, and then into a sitting position and then into an upright position and then moving into movement. Um, it doesn't sound like it's the traditional exercise that people might be thinking of, let's get you on a bike or get you on a treadmill. It sounds like it's actually very low level. It's slowly building up. And it sounds like if anybody's symptoms are being flared up by any of those things, you don't keep pushing through. You actually hold back and you even maybe even go back a step to try and get that stability again. Is that right? Absolutely right. And so on the note, on the note of breath work, um, we can kind of start at that point. So yeah. we decided to start working with breath work. We had the opportunity to work with a breath work coaching um, program. It's called Stasis. It's based here in the States. And so what we found with our patients very early on um, were patients were quite in a hyperventilatory state. And so ventilatory control, hypocapnia really becoming a problem. Um, and so that early phase is really focused on that ventilatory control, focused on nasal breathing, um, focused on really trying to stabilize metabolics if we think about it from that perspective, mm -hmm. which at its core, breathing and breath work is the easiest way to control the autonomic nervous system as far as I'm concerned. And so really teaching patients that awareness and exactly as you described this progression from supine based exercise, upright based exercise, 
in really controlled active range of motion, large muscle groups, slowly introducing the concept of sympathetic activity, right? Autonomic nervous system activity, and then bringing it back down to resting state. From there, patients move into a phase of overground walking intervals, which really we're working on slowly but surely increasing aerobic load. That RPE progresses very, very methodically in this phase, slowly but surely, and again, keeping an eye on the symptoms. And then ultimately getting patients to the point where they can tolerate something in the world of autonomics, it comes up often, the Levine protocol, which has some really terrific evidence behind it for things like autonomic dysfunction, um, mm -hmm. oftentimes can be called the CHOP protocol or the Dallas, but really looking at that Levine protocol um, that Levine and Fu proposed in 2018, getting patients to that point, but in a really graded fashion. So I think where the dichotomy comes in is we say graded aerobic exercise and the instinct is, well, 20 mm -hmm. minutes of aerobic exercise on a bike. And we found, and I will largely attest to that could be quite provocative for someone whose symptoms are just very, very uncontrolled. And so um, other things to point out is that symptom control is not always visible and apparent within session, especially from a physical therapy end. So while patients are doing it, they might feel fabulous and this is great and they're, they're on top of the world. And then within hours and sometimes even days, we're seeing these major symptom flares. And so being so mindful of that, even in the moment when things are super exciting and someone's feeling great, to be conscientious of intensity grading, absolutely important. Yeah, and that's such an important point because you mentioned right at the very beginning with um, you know, the, the presentations that were appearing and you started to recognize that long COVID was a thing and you mentioned post-exertional malaise. And I know that's got different terms. Post-exertional yeah. malaise is the most common one, but also some people use the term post-exertional neuroimmune exhaustion. Um, I've personally been using post-exertional symptom exacerbation because I know that malaise can sometimes feel like it's focused on fatigue and we know that's not always the only symptom that can be or exhaustion is not the only symptom that can be flared up so yeah that that, that concept of kind of post-exertionally people's symptoms getting worse a day or two later um does make it very difficult to navigate um in a physiotherapy session doesn't it about looking great right here but actually it's when they're at home two days later that suddenly the the, the flare-ups or the crashes start to happen and um, I think that's probably why it's so nice to hear that actually the program that you've been developing is very symptom um, focused. Um, sure. It sounds like it's very paced in a way. Um, it's, uh, and I, I think this is where language gets complicated, isn't it? Because different things mean different things to different people. Um, and I'm, I'm not surprised that the word graded has possibly caused some controversy. Um, and I think it might be because of the historical legacy of graded exercise therapy, um, which yeah. obviously in its definition is not based on symptoms. Uh, it's it's pushing through, isn't it? It's you gradually build up, you keep building up irrespective of your symptoms and you push through. And I think that's probably where there's the, the con controversy around that. I know in the UK, so the National Institute of Health Research here have recently coined a new term uh, that they're calling symptom titrated physical activity, um, which I think is probably due to the historical legacy of some of these things, but also recognizing yeah. that it's not pushing through symptoms. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think that's across the boards, I think in post-acute COVID or long COVID nomenclature has become such an important facet for all of us to consider, especially um, both as consumers of media, but also consumers of literature, because now the language has been a bit different here and there. And maybe what was traditionally thought of as a definition, like you had said, something like malaise or post-exertional malaise that is very specific and feels very particular to things like fatigue, but also to the CF and ME population. Um, when we start thinking about nomenclature, particularly in long COVID, I think it's important to get that clarification point so that we all realize we are actually on the same page in agreement for approaches. Um, and we're really thinking about how can we communicate this effectively. Yeah, completely, because I, I know that from what you've described, it sounds an incredibly sensible approach, um, which is completely recognizing that people's symptoms can be exacerbated by exertion. It's starting at a low level. It's taking into consideration the dysautonomic pattern that can be happening. So utilizing breath work and also the Levine protocol to try and build up on that. It sounds so sensible and it's actually really nice to hear that there is data that you've 
it sounds like you're you're willing to share in a way uh, that's yeah. going to be for peer review publication at some point but it sounds <laughs> like that data is is demonstrating efficaciousness um, it is and and that's been the great part to to get to this point and looking at that data to see that you know we really tried to take the holistic approach um, primarily first looking at patient reported outcomes which we'll be reporting on first and then down the line reporting on um, functional outcomes particularly from the physical therapy lens um, and mm. to see things again that that stood out so meaningfully one of the biggest things that we've noticed um, statistical significance and change for within the program has been fatigue which for so many of our patients has been the most debilitating of symptoms. Um, and then again, coming back to things like quality of life and, and perceived energy and things that are, are meaningful to each of our patients. Um, I'm so, so pleased to see that that change is possible and that an approach such as this is working, which is really exciting. Yeah, that is really exciting. Um, you talk about statistical significance. So I'm guessing that means that you've been able to compare different groups. So people that are going through the intervention and people that are not going through the intervention. Is that right? Precisely. Yes, so, precisely. And so, so what's happening yeah. between these two groups then? So like there's one group that are getting the intervention that are one kind of like on a waiting list or are they, is it like a, a randomized control style thing or how's it working? So it's, <laughs> so it's not a randomized control trial at this point, but it has been um, the feasibility study really looking at the intervention. And so individuals who were not in the physical therapy group um, there were numerous different reasons why they were not participants, um, but their starting level for symptom exacerbation was the same in the PT group versus the uh, non-PT group. And so being able to look at that quite a bit has been helpful to understand what are we actually getting at? Yeah. Yeah, because I, I, I must admit that was going to be my next question, which is, you know, <laughs> is the control group yep. <laughs> bad that couldn't do the group? And so that's why they look <laughs> No, thankfully. <laughs> I know. See, I see where that all goes. Yeah, no, we are. Uh, we're happy to say that, no, um, all of the groups were beginning at the same level of intensity or rather symptom intensity. Um, and so we're really getting a pure look at the efficacy of a physical therapy intervention. So from, from the research end of the world outside of my clinical hat and putting on my research hat that is quite an exciting thing to be able to report yeah absolutely, absolutely. and um like I, I i can hear as well kind of like terms that you were using there you talked about an energy window uh, obviously within the context of like me cfs pacing so kind of particularly uh, symptom uh, focused uh, pacing um rather than quota specific uh, pacing yeah. uh, the energy envelope uh, is something that's talked about a lot it sounds like uh, yeah. same thing different words doesn't it uh, so <laughs> yeah. and I think that's the interesting thing that we consider right especially when we're up against a novel diagnosis I think it's important number one not to rush to label something which again is why I'm not keen to label it this is CFME this is dysautonomia this is POTS but I do think it's important to draw from like diagnoses to understand similarities and differences. And so some of those concepts that we talk about in one population are definitely applicable across the boards if we start thinking holistically. Absolutely. And I think that's something I've also been saying throughout all of this as well, which is that we don't no, I, and not just me, many people have, uh, and I, I'm probably using the words of other people too, but we don't really understand the mechanisms of long COVID yet, do we? There's lots of hypotheses as to what it could be. So we don't really know what's causing it other than we had a virus, um, but we don't understand the biological mechanisms that are causing these symptoms. And so it, it's, it is too early to label things what it is or is not yet. But like you say, there's so much learning that can be translated from the, the kindness of other healthcare condition groups that are sharing their knowledge and skills. Those that predicted long COVID before long COVID was a thing, like particularly the MECFS community that are sharing their knowledge and skills about pacing, um, about um, being mindful of post-exertional symptom exacerbation or malaise and how sure. pushing through is not the right thing, you know, the stop, rest, pace message. And, and I was wondering, actually, um, amongst your um, your... Uh, protocol or your your program that you're doing if people are exacerbated what do are you incorporating like a, a pacing element or uh, like teaching about rest and pacing as well a great question so as symptoms are exacerbated we're really conscientious of several things number one the concept of energy conservation, really driving that message home the other thing that we find actually really quite helpful and we use very 
very much throughout the program is this idea of recovery breathing or breath work. And so we really go back to some of those base principles that patients learn and, and really adopt in their prehabilitation phase for breath work control. And we've been really happy to find that that's been quite helpful in starting to bring that symptom exacerbation back down. And so it, from the energy conservation, pacing, resting as needed. Um, other really helpful things, uh, we work with a terrific nutritionist on our team. So we've been making referrals for things like nutrition consultation as needed um, for things like hydration and good nutritional value, um, just to make sure that again, we're attacking this from all angles. So within the face or within the context of symptom exacerbation, those are really the primary things that we're implementing. So if, um... There's quite a lot in this in this program, isn't there, actually? And I suppose what I'm thinking is, is this completely novel in its approach? Or are there other healthcare conditions where this this approach, because I'm I'm not familiar with this kind of this low level starting with breath work, building upon that based on symptoms, bringing it back as needed, having a long term plan that people can fluctuate and change over time depending on their symptoms. You know, it sounds very bespoke. It sounds very sensible. It sounds slightly new. And, and I wondered if it is new or, or, <laughs> if, it, or, or, or if it exists elsewhere, I don't know. Um, so to my knowledge, it is quite novel and quite unique. And, and for that, our group is very, very proud. Um, the idea of interdisciplinary work is not something that's new to us. Um, our center really focuses on that quite a bit in other conditions. And so um, having those strong ties from the beginning and really thinking about how can we do this for long COVID or post-acute COVID has been, um, has been quite the adventure, but really so incredibly rewarding. But as far as the program itself goes and, and the ACT for PACS intervention, um, to my understanding, it is quite novel. I, I, um, I'm i quite proud of it myself. So, yeah. Oh, well, I, I can only say congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. So sensible, um, is working, and and it sounds like is is utilising approaches that is is making a difference to people's lives. Um, so it, it's fantastic to hear that. I know that from my own perspective, I don't know that... Um, I necessarily have done breath work, but I know that um, when I was at my most disabled um, and I was getting flared up of symptoms just by silly things, you know, like cognitive tasks were setting me off, I would find that my, I would get like uh, vice-like headaches before my symptoms would then crash or I'd have like mm -hmm. an episode or a flare up. Um, mm -hmm. And if I was able to control those headaches a little bit more, and I was using mindfulness actually, so I would lay down in a dark room and a lot of it was focusing on breathing, yeah. I would be able to get control of the headaches and then that would prevent the onward flare up afterwards and I was using it a lot so I and I've heard more and more people talking about doing similar things and it and it sounds like it's maybe not the same thing but maybe similar um in terms of like what you're talking about with breath work um in if, if someone was interested in learning more about breath work you know that that aren't in New York um yeah, that aren't that's able that's to right. access Mount Sinai um sure. what would you recommend would be a place where people could learn more about this type of breath work that sure. is a really good starting point for people. Sure, and I can definitely share the information. I am, I'm really happy to report that Stasis is um, both nationally and to my understanding internationally as well. Um, and they have just been absolutely an extraordinary group to work with. And so for that, I definitely would advocate for their services. Um, and then the, the quite nice thing about their program is they really have a customized approach where patients are able to get one in, one on one interaction. They are able to work in a group because I do think social support, community interaction um, is tremendous for this. And so having opportunities like that as well built into a therapy setting is really quite nice and it's unique. Um, so my advocacy for would be for it on that end. And, and I think that you brought up a great point in that it's not just physical symptom manifestation, cognitive symptoms, things like brain fog and cognitive um, differences are really, really showing up as well. Um, additionally, cognitive tasks fall under the energy window. So cognitive tasks can be just as impactful as physical tasks. So something like breath work coaching is lovely because it comes at both angles and really looks at both the physical and the cognitive. Absolutely. 
So what's the next steps then with the research that's planned? So it sounds like there's yeah. going to be quite a few potential papers coming out of this. Um, you yeah. know, what's the next steps in terms of disseminating this knowledge um, widely? Sure. Um, so we are, I will say our group has been incredibly collaborative. And for the longest time, we've been working nationally, internationally over the past year to share this approach. Um, so we want to provide this information to as many people as will find it helpful. Um, so from a research perspective, we are looking forward to getting several peer reviewed manuscripts out for review and hopefully out to the public. Um, from a research end, we also do have several other initiatives trying to understand some of those pathophysiological um, underpinnings of the diagnosis itself. And so I'm looking forward to that in the next year or so. Um, as a clinician, as a physical therapist, I'm really just eager to get this to more people because I think we have the opportunity to make a difference. And, and again, if there is one thing, this is a, a universally and a globally shared experience. And so the opportunity to be able to work together and to team together, both providers together and patients and providers. Um, it's a really wonderful opportunity that I'm looking forward to. Yeah, well, I think a lot of people will be very looking forward to potentially learning teams as well. Have you had, what's been the patient and public involvement in this? So what have, what, what have people living with long COVID been saying about going through this and the development of the service? It's been a really wonderful experience. I am um, I'm really privileged for that. Um, our patients have responded really well um, very early on, and even to still understanding their experience, understanding their symptoms, and what's working and what's not. And honestly, what's not working has been so so informative for us. And so um, that feedback has been crucial um, and continues to be crucial, which is why we do put quite the emphasis on patient reported outcomes. It's very meaningful for us clinically. Um, I think that the uh, the response to the intervention has been really quite positive. Um, we provide again, quite a bit of education very early on that this physical therapy experience will very, very likely be something that you have not experienced in physical therapy before. Um, if you've been to physical therapy for anything unrelated um, in the past, it may feel quite unique to you. Um, I jokingly tell my patients, this will likely sound easier than you want it to sound, and it will feel hopefully easier than you want it to. Um, but the priority of stabilizing your symptoms supersedes the one more repetition mentality. Um, so that usually gets a good chuckle, but also gets the understanding that uh, really this is a unique experience. And, and really as a, a physio myself, I, I can't prioritize enough the true bond that you're building with patients. And I think the teamwork and camaraderie that needs to go in this because this is a very long process. Um, so I definitely prioritize that relationship with my patients and, and those I work with because I think it helps us all get through. Yeah, absolutely. So what I'm thinking is this is a slightly different approach to physio um, and this is unusual, not only for the people that may be going through this approach, but I think also for physiotherapists globally. And I think that might also be why some of us that are physios living with long COVID have found this kind of jostle <laughs> between yeah. sharing our stories and physiotherapists not really getting it. Um, if you could share some key messages from your experiences to physios globally, not that everyone listens to this, but there's, <laughs> there's a few, um, you know, what would be your messages to physiotherapists sure. out there? Absolutely. Um, I think the first and most foremost thing is understanding that there is not a textbook on post-acute COVID. There, we are learning and it takes that same critical thinking skill that's made you the incredible therapist that you are. Um, it really takes that critical thinking skill to be able to understand what we're facing here. So I think that's the overarching, because I think that is a struggle, right? When we're facing something that the medical community at large is still understanding, it can be a bit intimidating. So trust that clinical skill set. Um, really understanding that no truer time than ever of listening to our patients and understanding where their symptoms are, because our instinct of pushing a patient to succeed, to get stronger, to have better endurance, to do more, 
does not fit the bill right now. And it's really important to take that into consideration because it does go against your traditional thinking and it does go against likely what you've been practicing for as many years as we've been in practice. So really understanding that you're not doing a disservice by not overcomplicating the program. Um, and most importantly, just think about what's in front of you and try to understand what you're seeing. And, and really, again, that critical thinking combined with your patient, um, you'll be successful in it. And it's something that we can all do. And, and it's an opportunity for physical therapists. Really, at this point, there is no pharmacological intervention that will solve this problem right now. Um, we're seeing that the best intervention is in the field of rehabilitation. And so it's a great opportunity for physical therapists to really step in and help people. So those are my overarching messages. I feel like I, I'm a huge advocate for the field. And so it's an awesome opportunity for all of us to help. I completely agree, actually. And I think it's what we've seen globally is how rehabilitation has come to the fore, not only in the acute setting, but now also in the uh, long term consequences of long COVID as well. And I think that, you know, rehabilitation does have such an important role, um, especially because we do not understand what's causing it. We do not have the treatments for it. And so when people are experiencing disabilities, Rehabilitation is a field that hopefully can try to support people if they are experiencing difficulties in day-to-day -day life, providing it's not making things worse. And I think that's where this is so nice to hear this approach that you've taken, which is that it's patient-centered, it's focused on symptoms, it's, it's powered back as needed, it's not pushing through. And that's the key thing, isn't it? And I think that's where a lot of us as physios have really struggled to, to click that message, which is, but you look fine when you were doing it. Um, and I know that certainly as a physio myself, that was where I went wrong. <laughs> I felt fine whilst I was doing it. I couldn't pick up the patterns. Why was I feeling so tired two days yeah. later? What the hell is going on? I know. Oh, it's, it's definitely a challenge, but I think that um, as, and I, I think the opportunity for discussion among those of us who are maybe seeing a higher population of individuals with uh, post-acute COVID or long COVID, um, I always tell, you know, every time I, I give a talk or I do a podcast, I always try to say, I, my email is accessible. If you have a question or you have a patient and you're not sure, let's work as a global community to answer those questions. So when you're saying, why am I, why am I, is my patient still not feeling good after therapy and you're doing X, Y, Z thing? It might just be that second set of eyes or second set of ears that might be helpful. Absolutely. I know that um, something that was mentioned quite early on in the pandemic is uh, some lessons that can be learned from other healthcare conditions. And um, I'm, I traditionally work in the field of HIV disability and rehabilitation. So I'm a physio that specializes in that area. And, you know, there's a global collective of us that are HIV physiotherapists that are interested in disability and rehabilitation. We're interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. And we've collectively worked around the world, mostly led by Canadian physiotherapists to try and harmonize our approach. And one of the things we were all saying at the beginning was like, would be really sensible if that kind of was translated into long COVID or what we didn't know yeah. long COVID existed then, but we're like into <laughs> COVID-19 uh, yeah. because we're going to need to be like a global collective that's focusing both from both a clinical and an academic perspective, looking at research priorities. And, and it feels like it's coming more and more true now. It feels like we do need this kind of global collective to kind of come together and share these exciting knowledge and skills that are being developed. And I know we live in a technological age where everything could be shared online but I think also so much is shared online it's difficult to see the wood for the trees so we almost need like formalized networks don't we and collaboratives to to be able to effectively disseminate knowledge and skills so, I agree um, entirely I do I think it's um it is, and it, it, I think your experience in HIV is so incredibly true as to that you start to band with other individuals who specialize in your area to share that experience. And it's that conversation of how can, not necessarily standardize, but how can we start to share information so interdisciplinary and so even within the dis discipline so that we're all starting to make that same change. And so I am as well, a huge advocate for it. Um, teamwork is definitely something that it makes our field unique from the beginning. And so I think this is a great time for it as well. Oh, well, Jenna, I feel like there could potentially be a collaborative starting. <laughs> I am, I am so eager for that. I, 
I would love every second of it. So absolutely count me in. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, well, this has been such a lovely conversation. So I do want to say thank you so much. Um, if people do want to reach out to you, what sure. would be the best way that you would like people to reach out to you? If you're on like social medias or how would you best like people to say, oh, actually sure. you guys are doing amazing work. Can we share? Sure, sure. Um, so I will definitely share my email. It is Jenna period at Mount Sinai.org. Um, as far as social media goes, I can be found on Instagram at DPT Jenna NYC um, as well. And so any any message and or interest, by all means, reach out. I am I'm always eager to chat. Absolutely. So straight on the Instagram. <laughs> yeah, just go for it. It's 2021. We might as well, right? I feel like that's what we've got. I've been shamed for not having other forms of social media. So I think that's my go-to. <laughs> oh my God, there's no shame. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I was gonna, I'm going to say thank you so much uh, for today. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs>